Okay, well, today we um, are seeing that the disciples were open to the Holy Spirit as they obeyed the command of Jesus to wait. And in turn, they received the fullness of the power of God Almighty. Now, God has promised us the same if we choose to wait upon him as well. Not because we fully understand or even have any part in it other than just surrendering to him. Not, um, he's faithful. Again, he is the promise keeper. And so he is faithful to his promises. Last week, we looked at the details surrounding the book of Acts. You can get the tape if you want to review that. But we're going to look tonight at Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 26. In verses 1 through 3, we see the prologue or the introduction to the book. Picking up in verse 1, it says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also predestined him alive, or I'm sorry, presented him alive after his suffering, speaking of the death of Jesus on the cross. By many infallible, I love that, they are infallible, they are sure, we can count on them, there's no disputing. These infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 6 tells us that he was seen by over 500 people all at once and then over a 40 day period there were many, many eyewitnesses to his resurrection. Now, the book was written to Theophilus. Now, Theophilus means lover of God. Some believe that this is speaking of a particular wealthy Roman official who had converted to Christianity. But the application for you and I here today is this. If you are a lover of God, this book is written and promised to you. How awesome is that? Are you a lover of God? Oh, good. I'm glad I'm at the right place. Well, my prayer is that as a church, as a, a corporate setting of women here together, that we would take this seriously and be open, not because we understand, but just be open to the promise of being filled with his Holy Spirit, dwelling in unity, which is the only way that we can be effective for his kingdom. Amen? So that's our prayer. And then in Acts 1, verses 4 through 8, we see the promise of the Father. It was after his resurrection. Remember in Peter, it says, what does he mean that he ascended unless, except for the fact that he first descended to the lower parts of the earth and he set the captives free and he preached to the spirits in prison. So Jesus, we know, for three days descended to the lowest parts of the earth. And then his resurrection, as he came back to the earth, was before 40 days, and then he ascended on high. Now remember, when he resurrected from the lower parts of the earth, he met over those 40 days with all the disciples. And at one point, he told the disciples, you guys go over to the Galilee and wait for me there. And what does Peter do when he gets to the Galilee? Oh man, the flesh dies hard, doesn't it? He said, hey guys, I'm going fishing. And then what do they do? I'm going too. So they all get in the boat and they go fishing. They're supposed to be waiting for Jesus who just resurrected. And they focus on fishing. So they get in the boat, they toil all night long and they catch nothing. And then Jesus appears on the shore the next morning and he says to them, hey guys, have you caught anything? And you ask a fisherman if they've caught anything? That's not a good thing, but they said no. And so he said, okay, well, let me tell you what to do. You task the, the net on the other side of the boat. And then they bring in this whole haul of fish, 153 of them, the Bible says. Well, did you know in numerology, 153 equals I am God? He was telling those disciples, hello, guys, you're out fishing, and I am wants to meet with you. You see, as they went out and did stuff that Jesus didn't tell them to do, it came to nothing. No fruit, zilch, nothing, not even one little fish. But as they did what Jesus told them to do, they couldn't even hold the blessings that was given to them. Well, when they got to Jerusalem, he finally gave them the instructions, including a command. 
In verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. In Luke 24, 49, Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. We're going to look at that in a minute. He says, But tarry. This word tarry means to continue to wait, to abide in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. John 14, 6 says that he, the Holy Spirit, will abide with you forever. So Jesus commands them to not do anything until they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you know, that's a good word for us all, isn't it? How many times do we step out in front of God and then we're, we can't figure out why it's not working or why, why we're toiling? And Jesus said, but I never told you to do that. Wait on me. And then we, uh, next we see the promise of the Holy Spirit fulfilled in Acts 2.4. Did you know that there are over 6,000 promises in the word of God? Did you know that? That's pretty amazing. I like just one promise, let alone 6,000, knowing that they will come to pass because our God is a promise keeper. But those promises are only as good as the one who promised. Hebrews 10, 23 tells us that he who promised is faithful. 2 Corinthians 1, 19 tells us for all the promises in him are yes, and in him, amen, as we abide in the person and work of the Holy Spirit, we will have yes and amen promises. It's all going to be good. And we, all we have to do, according to Luke eleven nine, 9, as Jesus said, is ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and it will, you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. That's a promise that we can count on. And unfortunately, if we don't know him, we're not going to trust him. If we don't know him, we will not obey him and we will not wait for him. But yet if we don't, we miss out on such huge blessings. So as Jesus dis commands the disciples to wait, notice he didn't tell them that they had to completely understand. And don't you like that? You know, I personally like the fact that I can't understand everything about God. Because if I could, what would that make me? God. And that would be a pretty sad God. I need to not understand. I need to just walk by faith and not by sight and wait on the Lord. You know, there's over and over and over again in Scripture, we are told to wait on the Lord. Why? Well, because as we wait upon him, we will draw strength. That's what Psalm 27, 14 tells us. It says, wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, wait on the Lord. And then in fact, Isaiah 40, 31, you guys are probably all familiar with it, but it says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength to the point that they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. I just started walking again. Ugh, I feel like I'm gonna faint all the time. I can't wait to wait upon the Lord and let him strengthen me for all that he has called us to do. Amen? He will strengthen us. In fact, Psalm 84, 11 says, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Of, o Lord of hosts, blessed is the man or woman who trusts in you. Well, back in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus gives a little explanation of his command using a contrast. Speaking of the promise in the second part of verse 4, he says, Which I said you have heard from me, verse 5, for John truly baptized with water, but, here's the contrast, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now Luke gives the contrast, and it's between John's baptism. You all know that John's baptism, the element was water, but the issue was repentance. Now, for you and I, when we are water baptized, it tells us in Colossians 2.12 that it's a picture of us being buried with him in the baptism as we go under the water, fully immersed, in which we are also raised with him as we come up through faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. In other words, it's an outward showing of our inward faith. But then Jesus' baptism. The element 
is the Holy Spirit, and the issue is power. So either way, the idea of being baptized is the idea of being fully immersed or completely covered or saturated. Isn't that a good picture? That we can be saturated completely with the Holy Spirit. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit would be that immersion. And while it's an experience for sure, it's really more of an ongoing condition as the Holy Spirit is within us and upon us as he promises to abide in us. And as we continually receive the filling of the Holy Spirit upon our lives, he continues to renew our strength. Isn't that awesome? That's how good our God is. That's how much God loves you. Well, for those who are taking notes, I just wanted to take a little side trip into the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to go through quick. So if you want to jot down the scriptures, you can. But the ministry of the Holy Spirit is seen in three Greek prepositions. Number one, the Holy Spirit is with you. It, it, the, the Greek word is para. How many in here tonight can remember back before you were walking with God and you can say, wow, I should be dead. But for the grace of God, but for the Holy Spirit that had his hand upon me, I would be lost. That is knowing the para, the Holy Spirit that came alongside of you that was convicting the world of sin, righteousness, of ju and judgment, the sin of rejecting Jesus in his way, the sin of righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and the judgment that will come for those who reject him. So the para, the para, the Holy Spirit came alongside you. In John 16, 7 and 8, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he, the person and work of the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So before we were all saved, the Holy Spirit came alongside us and pointed us to Jesus Christ. He was calling us. And then once a person is saved, we're filled to the brim as the Holy Spirit's ministry is to come in. And the Greek preposition is E-N. It's our I-N. So the Holy Spirit comes in us. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says that no one can even say that Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit takes place from the moment of salvation. John 14, 15 tells us that the spirit of truth who dwells with you, there's the para, and will be in you, there's the N, that is the Holy Spirit. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You are the dwelling place. He's chosen your vessel as a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. That is incredible. And that's how much he loves you and wants to use you. He wants to fill you so that he can say, you are mine and I'm dwelling within you. Well, then the next preposition is the epi, E-P-I. This is when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. This is the baptism with the Holy Spirit where he f immerses us completely, fills us to over flowing. Again, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And this indicates an unending supply of torrents of living water. And it's, it, it's, um, it's necessary to receive this, to experience God in a deeper level. And that's why Jesus said that it would be to their advantage if he left so that he could send the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts 1, Jesus promised the disciples that baptism with the Holy Spirit. We know that they were already saved at this point. They were his disciples. In John, we see that the Spirit breathed on them, and that's when they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And um, in Acts 1-4, it said that they were told to not depart from Jerusalem until they waited for the promise to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, which would be the fulfillment of the prophet Joel. And then in Acts 2-38, um, next week, we see that Peter tells those who the promise is for. As he says, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, is to you, to your children, and to all who are far off, speaking of the Gentiles, and then to all as many as the Lord God will call. How many of you in this room are called of God? 
Oh, good, half of you. No, you're all called of God or you would not be here if God had not called you to be here. And isn't that incredible to think you have been called of God, of Yahweh, the God of gods, the king of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things has called you. And he desires to put his spirit within you. So we all need the baptism with the Holy Spirit. But why? Why do we need it? Well, jot these verses down. There's just a, there's just a few because it's really a, a, a list that goes on and on and on. But I just pulled out a few. Why do we need the baptism with the Holy Spirit? Well, in Acts 1.8, we we'll see that we need, we need the power of the Holy Spirit in order to be witnesses for him, to literally be martyrs. How do you think Saeed is in jail, being tased repeatedly and beaten and and they don't even know what to do with the poor man because they keep moving him to, from jail to jail to hospital to jail because everywhere he goes, people are getting saved. They don't know what to do with him. Why? Because he's been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and he is speaking the gospel bold, proclaiming the kingdom of God. So that's what we need the Holy Spirit for. And then in John 16, 13, says that the Holy Spirit is what guides us in all truth. Do we need to be guided in the truth of the word of God? Absolutely. Man, this world is crazy with the things that are going on. We need his spirit to guide us into all truth. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 tells us that we need the power of his Holy Spirit to transform us into his glory so that we can reflect his glory onto a lost and dying world. Acts 4.31, we need the Holy Spirit so that we can speak the word of God with boldness. In John 15.8, we need the Holy Spirit in order to be fruitful in our service to him. What is being fruitful? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, Galatians 5.22. And then in 1 Corinthians 1.9, we see that we need the Holy Spirit for intimacy, for communion and fellowship with Jesus Christ. You get the picture. I mean, we could go on and on. But truly, we can do nothing of eternal value apart from the spirit of the living God who dwells in and through us. In fact, Zechariah 4, 6 says that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. There's no talent that we have that is more powerful than the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, then we see the win the baptism with the Holy Spirit can take place. Number one, simultaneously to salvation. As it did there in, in Cornelius' house when Peter took the gospel to the Gentiles for the first time at Caesarea Maritime. And it says that while he was still speaking the words of the gospel, that the Holy Spirit fell upon, that's our word epe, fell upon the congregation and the Jewish believers heard the Gentiles, they were astonished because they heard the Gentile believers speaking in tongues, which is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So while it can be at simultaneous to salvation, when people get saved, they can be baptized with the Spirit at that moment. It also, because we look at what the Bible has to say, it also can occur as a separate experience subsequent to salvation as it did in Ephesus. When we get to Acts chapter 19, we're going to see that when Paul went to Ephesus, he said to some of the disciples who were already saved, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered him and said, we've not even so much as heard of a Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? And then in verse 6 of Acts 19, when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon him, them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Again, a manifestation of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not the manifestation, but it is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians, um, Clark is talking, is is teaching through that on Sundays. So as you come on Sunday, stay tuned because he's going to get to the different gifts. We've got the Holy Spirit guide that leads, uh, lists them all out, that explains them with scriptures backing them. If you want to look further into that, I encourage you to get that and stay tuned on Sunday morning. It's going to be excellent. Now, it's clear that the disciples did not understand what they were to wait for or what was about to happen which gives me hope. I mean, God just, Jesus said, just go to, the, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. Now, are you like me? I'm going to be like, 
What's the promise of the Father? It's a promise? Can I have it now? Do I have to wait? How long do I have to wait? I mean, that would be, I would be going nuts. But they went and they waited. And then in Acts 1.6, it continues. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to, to Israel? Which, before were too hard on him, that was part of the new covenant, according to Jeremiah and Ezekiel. But notice Jesus didn't rebuke them, and I like that, because I would have been the one asking questions, just like they did. And in verse 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Again, this shows that God's timing is not always for us to know or understand. He doesn't always disclose all of the information, and that's how we are to walk by faith. As we simply wait on him, we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he will come. Now, I don't know about you, but I really have a problem waiting. My family gets so mad at me when Christmas comes around. I try to convince them to celebrate Hanukkah because Hanukkah, they let you open a present every day, you know? And I go buy presents for my grandkids, and it's like, can I give them a present today? And everybody, unison. No! What's wrong with you? I, I can't wait for them to open the presents. And when I was little, my sister and I were the worst My mom would wrap presents and put them under the tree, and just knowing there was a gift under that tree would drive me nuts because I knew it would be a good thing. And so, and I knew my name was on it. I knew it was for me. I didn't want to wait till Christmas. And one year, we decided to sneak downstairs after my parents went to bed, and we took a little exacto knife, and we very carefully unwrapped every single present and then wrapped them back up and put them back under the tree. And on Christmas morning, when we were opening the presents, my mom was like, why you guys are so, like, depressed or something. We're like, yeah, we already knew it was in the package. So the next year, she didn't put any names on any of the presents, and my brother was opening bras, and we were, it was crazy. And she goes, so are you going to do that again? Can I put your names on? We go, okay, we're sorry. We won't ever do that again. But I can't stand, I can't stand surprises. I really can't. And to think that they had to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. That would be the ultimate of promises. And then in verse 8, we see the clarification about what they were to wait for. Jesus said, but you shall receive power. That would have made it worse for me. I would have said, I want it now. Miracle working resurrection power. Not just some like little bit of power. Oh, that was powerful. No, this is like raising from the dead power. And when the Holy Spirit has come, there's our word again, upon you. And the result is that you shall be witnesses or martyrs to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So here Jesus is explaining that he's not talking about a political power for this earth, but rather a spiritual power for the kingdom to come. You see, as, as the study stated, the disciples were living in a hostile, paganized, and degenerate society, and they desperately needed empowerment. I don't know about you, But turning on the news is amazing. We live in a hostile, paganized, degenerate society. When people are more upset about animals being abused than babies being slaughtered and dismembered, we're living in a degenerate society. Just yesterday, I read that the pedophile is now a, they're putting it before Congress, that it's just a sexual preference. There's nothing wrong with it. Man, I'm like, yeah, hold on to your babies, ladies. Don't let them out of your sight. So we are living in interesting times. Do we need the baptism with the Holy Spirit today? We absolutely need the empowerment from on high. As we look around us, we know, and if they needed it back then, how much more do we need it today knowing that Jesus' return is imminent? The enemy is out there roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. So how much more we need the power of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Aren't you glad that we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And with God, we are empowered. And it doesn't matter what man does to us because we will live with him forever. God is so good. He's not only promised to do amazing things in and through our lives, but it will all bring glory to him. In fact, 2 Peter 1, 2, it says that Jesus has, according to his divine power, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who, is, who called us by glory or virtue, by which we have been, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious 
promises that through these things you may be partaker of the divine nature, having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. Aren't you glad that we can escape that corruption that is in the world through lust as we put on his divine nature? And, and we have been given everything that pertains to this life. Aren't you glad? We have victory in this life because of Jesus. If we would just do, as Pastor Chuck used to always say, stay under the spout where the Spirit comes out. Can you just picture that immersion of the baptism with the Holy Spirit? Just stay under the spout where the Spirit comes out because He is all we need. Well, then in verses 9 through 11, He speaks of the ascension of Jesus. And it says, when he had spoken these things, while the disciples watched, he was taken up and a cloud, thought to be the cloud of glory or the Shekinah glory of God, received him out of their sight. Now the ascension is, is important because it is our hope. The ascension guarantees the promise of the Holy Spirit. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 17 tells us that if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. This is a big deal. And then number two, not only is it our living hope, but it assures us of our ascension. In other words, we have that living hope as, for, as Peter speaks of in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. I love this passage. Blessed be the Lord and God and Savior of our, Je our, our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, according to his abundant mercy, begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you and be, as you are being kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What a great passage. We have a living hope because our Lord has resurrected. You know, no one else can claim that but Christianity. Biblical Christianity has the risen Lord. Nobody else has risen to eternal life. I don't care what religion it is, they have a dead hope because their God is dead and in the grave. Our God is not dead and in the grave. He died, but he rose again to life eternal. And so we have, too, that living hope. Now, as he was taken up in the cloud, we see the significance of Jesus being received in the cloud as he ascended into heaven, according to 1 Thessalonians 4.17, where Paul said he didn't want us to be ignorant. He wanted to want us to understand that those who died concerning those who had fallen asleep, lest we sorrow as those who have no hope. In verse 14 of 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep or that have passed away in faith. In verse 16, for the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is speaking of the body, bodies of those who have died, whether they were cremated or they died in the grave, their bodies are dust from ashes to ashes. And Jesus Christ, through the power of God Almighty, will resurrect and bring those ashes together and re resurrect those bodies. And then we who are alive, if we have not passed away when Jesus comes will, and remain, shall be caught up, speaking of the rapture of the church, the resurrection of the church, it's the same instant, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, Jesus doesn't come back at this point. We meet him in the air. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So we know that whichever comes first, whether we die or Jesus comes back, it doesn't matter. At the resurrection or at the rapture of the church, we're all going to be brought back together and we will be in his presence. And we trust and have absolute assurance that we will go to heaven when we die because 2 Corinthians 5.8 tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I say, praise God for that. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, will we be the one to meet him? Are you going to be numbered among the church that is raptured? You can be, but only if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, because Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but my, by me. Jesus said, I am the door. He is the way to get 
to eternal life. Well, back in Acts 1, in verse 10, it continues and says, While the disciples looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men, presumably angels, stood by with them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This is the same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven. He will also come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, wouldn't you just, don't you wish you could have been there? That would have been so cool, but guess what? We get to be there when he comes back, and we're going to be like the disciples just going, whoa, with their mouths open, just gazing into heavens. And the angels were, in essence, saying, you know what? God just gave you a command. Don't just stand there. Go. Do what he told you to do. This is the one that's commanding you. He has resurrection power. And so in verses 12 through 15, we see the prayer in the upper room. It says, the disciples returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, which is just a Sabbath day journey. You go from the Mount of Olives down through the Kidron Valley, and you're up in Jerusalem. And then in verse 13, and when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. A lot of scholars say that they think that's on the Temple Mount where they were. Luke lists the people that were present in the upper room on that day of Pentecost. He says Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, the son Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. And then verse 14, I loved this. They all continued with one accord. Now this is huge because how could this be? I mean, really, there was no, no, no problems anymore. These, this is the same group of guys that bickered. And, and argued about who would be the first. They were all about themselves. No, I'm going to be at Jesus' right hand. No, I'm going to be at Jesus' right hand. I mean, that, Jesus, you love me more, right? I mean, they were all full of themselves. But after they saw the proof of the ascension of Jesus Christ, and they realized that this was truly God, they went in their mind, gazing up heavenward. They came into the upper room, and because they had their focus on Jesus, it just automatically flowed. No more drama mama. It was just Jesus. And it was unity. And what a beautiful picture. And you know, that's God's desire for you and I in the church today. In fact, he prayed that in John 17. Jesus' prayer to the Father was for us. In John 17, 20, Jesus said, I pray for those who will believe me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us. Why? So that the world may believe that you sent me. Huge implications. What are we giving the world to draw them to the power of the Holy Spirit when we can't even get along? When, well, did you see what she said to me? Did you, you know, I mean, that we need to focus on Jesus. Who cares about me? It's all about Jesus. And then when we can dwell in unity and focus on the Lord, we will have true fellowship and communion, and the world will know that Jesus is God. And I love Psalm 133, one of my favorite passages in dealing with unity and the heart of God. He says, behold, and how, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. And then he ends the chapter of Psalm 133 and says, for there... There, there, in unity. It's in unity the Lord commanded blessings for life forevermore. Isn't that beautiful? In unity, God commanded blessings. That's where we will find blessings. So what do you think? Is unity important? Absolutely. Back to Acts 1.14, the second part of it, it says, they all continued with one accord in prayer, talking to God in agreement because they had the resurrection Jesus in their mind and supplication as they appealed and, appealed and entreated on behalf of his people with, I love the fact that they name, says with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Now his brothers, did they believe that Jesus was the Messiah? Never, yet they are with them in the upper room. They believe now because they know that he was the risen Lord. Um, we see who was in the upper room with them, and I love that fact, because looking at this mess of people, individuals, and to know that they were in unity, and they were obeying the commandment of God. Well, in Acts 1.15, we see the fall 
of Judas in 115 through 20. In verse 15, it says, In those days, the days that they were waiting on the promise, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, and altogether the number of names was about 120. And he said, Men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled with the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. In other words, Judas didn't thwart God's plan. If we looked at it with physical eyes, that's what it would look like, wouldn't it? Like, how could you betray Jesus? Now he's arrested and his ministry's cut short. But that's not what happened. He fulfilled God's plan. And it was told, it was fulfilling prophecy. It was foretold that this would happen. And in verse 17, it says, For Judas was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. That always blows me away. Even though Jesus knew he would betray, he still chose him to be a part of the church, of his people. And then in verse 18, now this man Judas purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and his entrails gushed out. Now here it says that he fell in the field and his entrails gushed, gushed out. In other places in the scriptures, we read that Judas went and hanged himself. So it's not a contradiction. In fact, when we go to Israel, they always point out the acacia tree and they call it the Judas tree because there's thin branches. And they say the tradition says that Judas hung himself on the Judas tree, this acacia tree. And what happened is his body started to bloat. And, and if you've ever seen that, you don't want to. It's gross. But the branch broke, and when he fell, his body burst open, and his entrails fell out. I know it was gross. I'm sorry. But that's how they reconcile the two reports. But here we see worldly sorrow in Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. And instead of going to him in repentance, he just had worldly sorrow. Because if he would have gone to him in repentance, Jesus said, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse you and to fill you with and to get rid of all unrighteousness. The Bible says that he forgets and he forgives and forgets. He throws our sins from the east to the west, never to be remembered again. So if he had truly repented with godly sorrow, then he would have been able to move forward. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, it says, Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But instead, we see Judas had the sorrow of the world that produces death. And then in verse 19, it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. It was called the field of blood, not only because Judas's blood was spilled there, but also because the blood or the field was purchased with the blood money given to the betrayer of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 20, for it is written in the book of the Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office, a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So now Judas is dead and in verses 21 through 26, we see the promises or the process in which they needed to fulfill to replace Judas as one of the 12. And in verse 21, we see, therefore, of these men who have accompanied us, this is what the requirement was, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. You see, it was a legal term. There had to be an eyewitness for it to have any weight with him going out and, and being part of the disciples. So in verse 23, they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, O Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. In verse 26, they cast their lots because they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. That's how they did things. And the lot fell on Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And we know nothing about Matthias. His name is only mentioned here. It's never mentioned again. Um, we know that he witnessed John's baptism and he was with the disciples. He was with Jesus as a disciple with the, the, uh, the 12 apostles. And he witnessed the ministry all the way up until his ascension. But the church tradition tells us that Matthias was stoned to death and then his head 
was cut off. But some say, some say that the disciples rushed into replacing Judas with, Messiah, with Matthias as they limited God with only two choices, and they should have waited for Paul. But we really can't say we weren't there. And ultimately, it really doesn't matter what we think because the Bible says that Matthias was numbered with the 12th. And it doesn't say it was a mistake, so we don't assume it's a mistake. In fact, in Acts 2.14, next week, we're going to see that when Peter gives his message, it says that he was with the 11, which would have included Matthias at that point. So, in fact, as I thought about that, I thought, you know, the disciples were actually a really good example for you and I today. If we followed this pattern for when we made a decision, we would be doing really well. It says that they, they obeyed. They were in unity. They were in fellowship, and they were in prayer together. They have one accord they were in the scriptures. They did it according to the scriptures. They desired God's perfect will. They sought his choice. They said, God, you know the hearts of men. You tell us who you choose. And they relied upon God to direct them in their decision. So ultimately, we see, as we back up and look at Acts chapter 1, we see that God has a plan that was established before the foundations of the world. And he is working that plan out regardless if we understand it or not. Because God's God. And we need to come to grips that we're not always going to understand. The plan will never be brought about by our own ability. It's not going to be because we want it to happen or we think it should happen. It's only through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we, you and I can bring glory to God. And that is his plan. And it'll happen only as we wait upon him. And that's when his spirit will give us strength, the strength to overcome the difficult circumstances that are in our life. And remember, we may not always understand the how, the when, or the why, but we will always understand who if we look to Jesus. And we will always understand that he is faithful and that he can bring enabling power through the power of the Holy Spirit as he immerses us through the baptism with, as his spirit comes upon, just as in the day of Pentecost, we too can be empowered to be witnesses to him to Jer Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And we can be enabled to live a life that is pleasing to him. As I was thinking about this, I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought, we can either toil or we can tarry. And I'm telling you, I'm so tired of toiling. Are you tired of toiling? We just work and work and work and work to try to bring about God's plan. We think we know best. And, and the, the writer of the Hebrews said, just be diligent to enter into his rest. Rest in him. Wait on him. And he will strengthen you for the work that he's called you to do. I'd like for everybody just to bow their heads, close their eyes, and it comes up. I just want to put it before you. Is there anybody in here tonight that is just tired of toiling? And they, dis they, they want to choose to tarry. You just want to choose to wait upon the Lord. You want to let God take that burden of that backpack off of your back that you came in here with. Whatever that situation, whatever the circumstance that you're dealing with, you're tired of toiling and wrestling with it. And you just want to say, God, I want to give it to you. I want to wait for the promise. I need you to come upon me. Saturate me, God, with the power of your Holy Spirit. If there, is there anybody in here? Just flip up your hands so we can pray. I just want to see, is there anybody tired of toiling? I see the hands. And I guarantee there's probably more. There's probably more. So let's just go before the Lord and let's give it to him. God, we just thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the living hope that you've given to us. But most of all, God, I thank you that you have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we do not have to toil we can just tarry. We can be diligent to enter into your rest because, Lord, that is where we will find peace for our souls, that peace that passes understanding, passes the understanding of anything that's happening around us. Though the world may fall apart, God, we're going to stay with you because you will deliver us into the land of victory. And, God, we don't fight from the position of uh, or for victory. We fight from the position of victory because we are in you. God, I pray that your spirit would come upon us tonight in a fresh way. God, that we would be obedient to just receive 
all that you have. God, I pray that you would help me, God, just be filled with your spirit, Lord, so that you can speak, that you can lead, you can guide, you can direct, and you can go before us, Lord, and make those crooked paths straight. So, Father, the people that are here tonight, Lord, that are carrying the burdens, Lord, would you just lift them? Take them, God, and carry them for them. For, Lord, you said, if any who are heavy laden, who are burdened, Lord, that just let them come unto me, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest for your weary souls. Jesus, we want to accept that tonight. We just take that rest in place of that toil that we've been carrying. And we give it to you, and we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for the empowerment of your spirit. We thank you for the joy that comes from being in the presence of the Lord. And God, we thank you for the rest that we can enter into that is offered so freely if we just stay under the spout where the spirit comes out. So Father, we just thank you. We praise you, and we just commit our lives to you. In Jesus Christ's most precious name, and all God's women say, amen. Let's stand as we worship before we're dismissed.